We're good. Hello, everybody. My name is Alec Powell, and on behalf of myself and another theater company, I would like to welcome you all to tonight's platform series discussion. Tonight, we are talking about LGBTQ plus um, issues in theater, and I'm so excited to have this incredible panel here with us tonight. I'm going to go ahead and turn the floor over to them to introduce themselves and let us know a little bit more about them. Let's start with Chelsea. Okay, great. Hi, I'm Chelsea Hickman. I am a playwright and an actor um, here in Utah. Uh, I guess where I kind of live with theater, um, I, uh, I had the privilege and honor of having one of my plays be put up by another theater, um, this time actually last year. The play is called Safe, and um, it explores the relationship between two women within the LDS faith and their love story. So. Yeah, that's a little bit about me. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Um, Lisa? Hi, my name is Lisa Hall. Um, I am a writer and a director and a teacher. I'm a teacher at UVU. And um, yeah, I, I am a playwright and I direct uh, at school at UVU and in a few other places and have had the chance to direct for another, which was amazing. Um, so that's me. Thank you. Danielle. Hi, I'm Danielle Tinarelli. Um, I am an actor and um, I, do, I do a lot of things and I make my living doing uh, graphic design and art and commissions and painting and things like that. But um, I've been doing theater um, since like early high school and I'm also trans, male, male to female, but I go by she, her, all that. Awesome. And Taylor. I'm Taylor Nelson. Um, I, um, I'm one of the co-founders of Anna the Theater Company, and I do a lot of different things in theater, um, directing, dramaturgy, teeny bit of playwriting. I technically act, but haven't in like six years, I realized recently, which is bizarre. Um, yeah, just do whatever. And then a lot of like research stuff as well. <laughs> awesome. So uh, like I said before, today's discussion is all about uh, people who identify in the LGBTQ plus community in theater. And our first question is directly correlated to how we've experienced that. So our first question tonight is, what experience, what is an experience where you have experienced homophobia, transphobia, and how was that handled? Or was the situation handled at all? And if not, what do you wish would have happened better? Does just anybody answer? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> well, I, I can start. Um, so I, as of uh, lately, modern times, now there is a difference between modern and 12 years ago, huge difference. Modern, um, it's really, there's really nothing. I haven't really felt anything uh, in a negative way. Uh, in 2008, I did a show and I was stealth. I was not, well, at least I thought I was. Um, stealth meaning that I wasn't telling anybody that I was trans or that I used to be male or anything. And, um, you know, and I, I have worked on my voice and things like that to make sure that people don't think that. But that was years ago when I transitioned. I transitioned in 2004. So it was four years after I transitioned, I did a show uh, it was a funny thing happened away on the way to the forum, and um, one of the one of the actors in the show knew me beforehand, and I had kind of you know nudged him saying, "Okay, please don't tell anyone." You know, we're like we've got like dressing rooms here and stuff. You know, let's let's be cool. And he was like, "Oh yeah, no problem." Anyway, um, uh, it was probably right before we, we actually started putting on the show after rehearsals and the show was about to open, um, the director was like, um, yeah, so I've been hearing rumors. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, you know, and you hear things and he was, he was cool, but this is 2008 and it's, I've made amends with him since it's no big deal, but he was thinking, or the way he explained it was, well, you know, the ball's in your court. Um, there are people who have issues with 
uh, the dressing room, which I still find weird, but whatever. But it was, um, you know, dressing room this, dressing room that. Some people are, are uncomfortable. And uh, I was like, well, I'm not gonna quit. <laughs> I mean, why would I, why would I quit? You know, some, if people wanna have a problem. But it was more or less talked about in a hush way. And the guy, it was the guy who told him and he went around. And so I confronted him and said, what, what's the deal? Why did you feel you needed? He's like, I just think for the safety of everyone, uh, it, everybody needed to know. And the director needed to know first so he can tell everyone. And I've, I've still to this day not got that because it feels like it's like with the bathroom bill and things like that. Like what exactly, what exactly do you expect me to do? You know what I mean? It's a dressing room. We're not like, I mean, really when you're in a dressing room, especially, in the, and this is something funny that I've learned between men and, and women in the dressing rooms for shows is you don't really get naked or anything. You know, it's nothing too exciting. Maybe somebody does if they're like a full costume, but even then I'm still trans, I'm still female. You know, I had had surgeries, everything done by them. And it was still a threat. Now that was 2008. I did a show last year and uh, in a more conservative area. And honestly, everybody was just fine. In fact, a lot of the, a lot of the girls that were, you know, 19, 20, they thought it was the coolest thing in the world. And so they heard, they would, they loved talking to me about it. So, so yeah, modern times, nothing too bad so far. Um, but yeah, back then it was just, it was always this underlying negativity and people being scared and weird stuff and getting mad and trying to get me fired. And that's why I kept it a secret. Thank you so much. It's, it's weird that people in theater or in that situation felt the need to share your business. We were there to do a job. And so to get in the way of that, it just, it's a little baffling. Yeah. They just didn't want to mind their own business, which is weird. Cause it's kind of like, just don't worry about it. <laughs> I'm not doing anything. I was actually very hands off with everyone. I was very uh, in the background, you know and I never really made a scene or anything because I was worried uh, that constant worry was there. And, and then somebody reacted and then it was like, oh crap, <laughs> you know, but then I don't know, I got over, the director was doing what he could and he, he handled it fine for the time. He could have just said, uh, get out of here, weirdo, but he didn't and that was good. Thank you so much. Um, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I, so largely I, especially in the last several years have had a fairly large amount of privilege as an LGBTQ person in a conservative, conservative area. I think just as a, I don't know, fairly large, sometimes can present as somewhat butch um, white gay man. There's, I'm kind of like at the, there's not a lot of, uh, I don't know, I have a lot of privilege, I guess. Um, so it hasn't been too much of an issue lately, um, but when I was in high school and like early college, um, there was kind of just a sense of my, I don't know, of being different, I guess, that like, not just like, I don't know, like that I, I felt sometimes singled out a bit, um, but it was always kind of fine. Um, one like specific circumstance that does come to mind that actually was sort of more recent, it was still like five years ago, um, was um, in school. Um, I had a professor um, who um, I, ah, um, sorry. Um, who I, I did a scene um, from The Normal Heart, um, which if you're familiar with it, it's a scene where the main character, Ned Weeks, is talking to his brother. And it's basically him trying to get his brother to accept him for being gay um, and to help him with, because it takes place during the early years of the AIDS crisis and to just kind of like help and give him his support. And he's not doing that. And he just refuses to accept that 
part of his brother's identity. And they're otherwise very close. So like they have a very close relationship, except there's this barrier there. Um, and I remember after the scene, um, it was a directing scene, um, I, the professor made a comment about how, um, he said good things about the scene, but then he made a comment about how now things have changed to a point where the conversation might go the opposite direction completely. And that like, it might be, it would be the, the, the gay man who is not accepting of his, his brother. And I'm like, of, of his straight brother, of like his straightness. And it was just this weird jarring, like, oh, there are people that are like my mentors that don't get it like at all. And so it's, it was small, I mean, kind of, um, and it didn't feel like it was directed at me personally as much as like, oh, this is the environment that I'm working in. I forgot, I live in Utah still, even though I'm able to kind of do what I want to do, I still, I forget sometimes that that is the kind of like opposing view um, that, the things that I understand to be true about the way our society works, um, other people just don't get it. So if in, in that situation, do you wish uh, that you would have done something more? Or do, was it, what, did it just run the course the way it was supposed to? Um, I, I think because of, I mean, at this point I was like 25 um, and I was, I was older among the students in, oh my goodness, okay. Um, and so I, I, I had a fair level of like confidence and just kind of outright said like, no, that's not right. It isn't that way. And I also had a lot of close friends in that class several of who were gay and we all just kind of shut him down, which was a delightfully satisfying situation. Um, many of you may know who this person probably was um, but who he's someone who I have a lot of feelings about, good mix of respect and something else for that person. Um, but, and I think he knows that. I don't think he'd have a heart, a problem with me saying that. Um, but it, it, it went pretty well, honestly. Like I, I think that if, conversations could go like that more often, then that would be great. Um, but again, I recognize that I have a lot of privilege in that situation. I would like to say thank you for using that privilege to correct a potentially harmful situation. It's In the academic setting, it's incredibly hard to be so vulnerable and then receive criticism that is not valid. <laughs> I actually have a, I, I think from the point of view of a director and a professor, I hear a lot of the kind of value judgments on the other side of the table that are so interesting because I haven't been an actor for a really long time. So I haven't experienced it in that way, but I'm sort of on the other side of this equation. And I think it's so strange because theater is such a haven for the queer community. And yet it's also a practice where as directors or as writers, there's this feeling that we can shape this actor to perform the way we want them to perform. There's an expectation that we can guide them or change them into our vision for the project, right? So I have um, been doing auditions with other directors, like big group auditions or whatever. And you, you hear a lot of people get commented on, well, they're too, they seem too gay. They're too effeminate to do this, or I'd have to control this about them or change that about them in order to meet my vision. And so I find it to be like a really uneasy juxtaposition of being a place where a lot of people who are, um, like divergent in the most wonderful way are put into this situation where people feel like they can um, shape them. It's disheartening for sure, because I think that 
a lot of people don't think twice about that saying someone's to this or to that, or you can't act this way or that way, or be this way or that way. Um, in the rehearsal room, I, I, or in the audition room, I think the best way is to bring it back to the skill or the content that that person is bringing, skill and content that doesn't have to do with how they present. Um, and otherwise, I think as a writer, I try and um, base partially on this, you see really talented performers and you are not in a position to do anything and you see directors turn them away because they are too butch or too effeminate, depending on what people are doing. So um, I've written in my writing, I usually try to include characters but that has nothing to do with it so that if they do sound any way they sound, their voice sounds, who they are, their content or their skill can be brought to bear on a role where the dramatic question doesn't have to do with the tone of their voice or their mannerisms. Um, Cause I think that's a compliment to having roles where the, that's, that's a strength. But yeah, I, it's like erasure, trying to make people into perfect little, um, the actor bots. Yes, absolutely. You hit on several salient points that I want to come back to in a second, but first I want to hear from Chelsea. Yeah, um, so I guess with experiences that I've had with homophobia, they're a little bit different. Um, I identify as bisexual. However, in the world that we live in and our current society, I easily pass as just a straight woman because I am married to a man. And um, so in that context, I think homophobia and how it's been directed towards me and received by me um, has mostly been erasure of my attraction to women because I'm simply married to a man. Um, that's been one thing that I've been working through and with other people in my life over the past couple of years um, is that frustration of my attraction to men and my um, um, and that side of my sexuality is never questions. It's always accepted. But this other side of my attraction to women, my sexuality in that way is always questioned and always um, thought of as not legitimate. And um, it's a legitimate part of myself. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so I'm trying to find the balance there um, with those um, outward voices versus my inward voice of who I am. Um, and yeah, so, I think just direct quotes of homophobia have been, um, are you sure it's not a phase? Um, are you sure you're actually attracted to women and you don't just wanna be them, you know, oh, that. Um, and uh, um, what does your husband think about this? Because for whatever reason, that needs to be a question that's brought up. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, yeah. So those are just a couple of experiences that I've had um, with, my being more outward um, in my bisexuality, so yeah. Thank you, and I, and I realize some of those uh, questions probably are being fielded in the rehearsal room where people are trying to, to get to know you and that's, it, that's a fine line of bordering on microaggression. So what would you, what would you say to someone in that situation? Because it's, it's tough to, you know, we all want to make friends in theater. We all want to be that, that supportive group but questions like that, th there's not really a place. So how do you, how do you direct that away from there? Yeah, um, I mean, it's, uh, it's still not easy for me um, in big group settings where um, careless remarks are just said. Um, but one thing that I've been trying to work on is actually speak up for myself instead of just uh, roll over and take it because it's not appropriate and it's not a safe, um, it's not a safe thing to do. And as I was already mentioned before, theater should be a safe place. It should be a haven, right? And, um, and as soon as any sort of um, judgment is being made on another person and these very personal parts of themselves, that safety is gone, that trust is gone. And um, so in handling those situations, I just try to trust my partners, trust, um, trust who I'm working with. And if at any time that I don't feel safe, I talk with them about it. And, um, and rather than following their example of being rude and awful in front of a big group of people, um, I usually try to take them aside and talk with them one-on-one -on -one, um, for a more constructive conversation. Yeah. 
Absolutely. You, you know, theater is all about educating, whether it's your audience or yourself. And I think especially in that situation, it is more than valid to educate people against what you should and shouldn't say in a rehearsal room. Lisa, you talked about creating actors to fit a mold or a box and creating robots. As we, as we move towards a more uh, a, a newer form of theater where we're seeing different people being represented, what would you all say to someone who is stuck in their ways about traditional casting? You know, we, there's a very clear lack of binary, non-binary characters and theater is up to this point has been littered with, you know, overly gendered tropes and lack of trans and there's a lack of trans visibility. What do we say to those who are writing the art? And then what do we say to those who are directing that art? Those are the people you know, at the top and it all has to work down from there. I, I will say that I feel really strongly that um, not just formal educators, but we're all sort of in a community where there are people coming up and there are people on the other end that we have to aggressively encourage and support people writing new work that reflects our, the changing world. Because what, you know, for the most part, it's what starts out on the page that, that is like the roots of what comes out of it. Um, and I, it's no wonder that I, I feel like it's probably true that a lot of people are not, in, I mean, they're not told to stay away from writing or directing, but they sure aren't encouraged, are they? They sure aren't singled out and say, hey, I want your voice. And, you know, and so I think that is, crucial. Um, I think more writers need to specify that their plays can and should be done in any manner appropriate. So the problem is people don't write that and then people get shy. So I always write these, these are not written for a particular gender identity. This character is not written with a gender identity in mind, or this character is not written with a race in mind and it's freeing people from there. But I, I, you know, what do you say to the people who are on the other end of that? You say, hold on, hold on. It's gonna happen and it is happening and, and um, it's not marginal. Thank you, thank you so much. That is so insightful. It's, uh, you know, a lot of the, the contemporary theater we see, which is there are four, five, six, seven big uh, production houses that license the rights and I you know I wish I wish in some world there was a conversation that there was a dialogue there between being able to open up scripts and make them more diverse um I there's a um there's a writer um Sarah Schulman who's wonderful, I love her so much. Um, she has an essay she wrote that has a fantastic title. Um, it's, uh, oh shoot, now I can't remember what it is. Um, it's so, Supremacy okay, Ideology Masquerading as Reality. Yeah, I'll look Trouble it up. Facing Women Playwrights. Um, and she talks about just like how the, it, it, it's specifically about kind of our, our system that favors male playwrights and favors male written works. Um, and she, um, she is a lesbian playwright and she specifically talks about that as well. How like theater compared to like film or TV has long been kind of a bastion of white gay male representation, um, but not really other forms of LGBT queer representation. Um, and I, when I first read that, I was like, That's, that seems strange. Like, is that true? And then I realized, oh, I can't think of any, when she actually says this in the essay, like there's not really any like lesbian works in the theatrical canon. Um, like there are now. Um, but at the time of writing this, like, this was pre like fun home and indecent. And other than those two, I can't really think of any like mainstream lesbian works that have been on Broadway, which is weird. 
um, and frustrating. And it's a similar situation with, um, it's a similar situation with trans works. Um, there's not a ton of bi representation, so much white gay male representation, so much of it. Um, and I think that what we can kind of do to address that is just on every level, um, Lisa was saying, like, like Lisa was saying, like, so, so, mm, I don't remember exactly, like, so basically just supporting new work um, to reflect our world. And, but also just like, if you have opportunities also use those to give other people opportunities. Um, and just at every, like, we probably can't really influence what's on Broadway right now, which of course eventually influences what's everywhere. Um, but we can do whatever it is to elevate those voices, even if it's just reading things, like reading what's there so that we're aware of it and can use it in monologues or recommend it to other people. Um, I don't know that that actually answers the question you asked at all. I'm realizing I went off in a very different direction, um, but I think it applies to this panel. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, yes. Um, I think for me with theater and um, this idea of traditional casting and you know, minds being set in certain ways, um, personally, I think theater isn't necessarily supposed to be a comfortable place where we can sit and stay stuck in our ways. Um, I personally feel that theater is a tool for change. It is a place of revolution. It is um, a place to welcome anyone and everyone. Um, and, uh, and this is just something that I've, I've thought a, um, a lot about as well, is that um, theater allows us to find our story in any character's story. Um, and that's what I um, actively strive for with writing my plays is making sure that no matter what the character stories are, that any audience member can also place themselves in an empathetic way into the character story. Um, if you're just willing to look hard enough, right? Um, there needs to be some sort of um, accountability and some sort of um, recognition that you need to try in order to, like if you're having a hard time finding your story and, and something that you can't relate with, try harder <laughs> um, <laughs> because we, we owe it to others. We, we owe that empathy. Um, and it's hard making yourself accountable for prejudices you may show outwardly or think inwardly, but that's the hard work that's being asked of us with theater, so yeah. You know, can I add something? So um, I personally, now I think it would be great to have characters that are all, all sorts of everything, you know, no matter what you are, um, no matter what you wanna be, no matter what the character portrays. Funny thing is, is me, um, I honestly just wanna play traditional female, like I don't only wanna do that. I just think it would be great to play traditional female parts. Now I'm realistic and I know I probably won't, but um, I have, you know, like I was cast as Morticia in Adam's Family and that was cool. That was really cool. And there was gonna be no kind of, um, oh, that's really a trans woman playing Morticia or anything. It was just gonna be straight up straight. And uh, it just, it didn't work out, but it wasn't because of that, it was other things. But um, I think it would be amazing. And it's what I've been trying to do for a while is just to play regular female characters. I think a lot of trans women would love to do that. I really do. Um, and I do think it's, it's very possible. It's a very realistic thing, so. Oh, absolutely. You know, we see so often, we change keys to accommodate a voice. Why can't we shift an entire song? There is nothing that says yeah. that's not acceptable. And the fact that we don't do that as, an, as a community at large is so frustrating. <laughs> and. You, you know, it's, it's the difficulty of we don't want every single queer artist story to be about someone being queer. It's that they are, they just get to exist. And that's, and that's more than enough. And it, it's, 
you know, I believe it was Chelsea who said this. It, it, it is going to take time top down, but it, it feels like we are on that path. Um, speaking of Chelsea, you uh, brought up um, viewing yourself in the theater you create. And I would just like to hear from all of you, what was the first time you saw yourself as a, as a, as a person in the queer community on stage and how did that impact you? I'll, I'll go ahead and go. Um, so I remember the, uh, my fresh, I, I may have seen something earlier than this or read something earlier than this, but I do specifically remember my freshman year of college, um, just turned 18 and I heard about Angels in America um, and I ate it up, um, just loved, loved, loved it. Um, I think like many, gay Mormon boys. I just really related to Joe. Um, like many other gay Mormon boys later in life, I realized I'm not a Joe, I'm a prior. Um, and it, it was just so interesting to see just parts of myself laid out so beautifully and eloquently. Um, but beyond just encountering that play, um, a couple years later, I was at University of Utah and uh, took, they have a queer theater class there. At the time it was taught by Jesse Portillo, when it was him, um, he's delightful. Um, and it was just just realizing, that's, that's when I realized that there was so much queer theater out there and that it, as opposed to like, again, like I think that things have changed a little bit now, but just theater I feel like is, a decade or two ahead of where film and TV are. And so there's just a huge amount of like wonderful, wonderful work. And that was, I think I, I actually in high school really wanted to get into film. Um, and I think that discovering how much more of the people um, theater can be because it doesn't have to cater to, well, will this make huge amounts of money um, I mean, it does still have to cater to that. And it certainly is like capitalism is very much a problem in theater, um, but it isn't as much as with film or at the very least it's much easier for like a smaller work to get made. So like maybe on Broadway, they won't make theater about this, but this small little theater is supporting this new playwright and they're doing it. And then that gets noticed by other people and it can, there's a lot more like from the ground up work that happens in theater than other mediums, I think, um, or at least other popular narrative, dramatic text-based mediums um, like TV and film. Um, and I don't know, it's just such a wonderful thing to see who you are and see that like your life experience is valid. Um, and that's, for me, that's like a main focus of why I do theater and why I want to do theater. And I want, again, I recognize that as a gay, white, cisgender man, that like that is different for me than it maybe is for other people. Um, and I want to help continue that work of expanding that like representational field because it's thrilling. Thank you. And I would like to add an addendum to my question. I realized I didn't leave an out for this. If you haven't felt that you have seen yourself in the art you've consumed, what would you like that to look like? Uh, you know, it's interesting because um, kind of going back on the, on the actual trans and uh, you know, other gender kind of characters or even switch roles you know, that, that do happen. Um, I, I technically have always played females. Now I've auditioned for shows like, um, I would love to do a Hedwig because Hedwig, even though Hedwig's not trans specifically, um, he goes through literally every single thing that trans people do when they transition, every single thing. And um, there's certain songs like Wig in a Box and stuff that I, you just can't, I can't explain the trans experience probably more than wig in a box from that show because 
uh, it just means, it's just amazing. It was written, and I mean, I heard that when I was 20 and I was definitely not transitioned. I transitioned to 24. And in many ways, I think that actually inspired me to do it. But um, I think I, if I could play Hedwig and bring that realism to that character, I would 100% do it. And I would think like, okay, you know, I'm actually doing something that represents, that represents me in the way I really am. Uh, other than, you know, General Cartwright from from Guys and Dolls, where I just basically played it as Frankenfurter. <laughs> and it was a weird choice, but people loved it. But, you know, it's not really like a representation role. <laughs> but I think Head would, would be awesome. That's just, that's me. But I have, I have yet to really feel like um, I've done anything that really forwards the community, I guess. <laughs> Well, I will speak on behalf of myself and probably everyone else in this panel. We would all love to see that. <laughs> Thank you. Someday. Is Chelsea okay? <laughs> um, she, I, she has to go. So I think this is her bowing oh. out. Okay. I thought maybe she passed out. <laughs> I would say it's strange because I, you know, in a lot of ways, like Taylor and Chelsea, I feel like there's so much about me that passes and is visible. You know, my experiences as a mom are really reflected well in the media and all of that stuff. But I will say from the time I was probably 15 or 16, I always made a point to consume um, shows or books or anything that were representing queer stories. And I think it's because I feel like a little part of me is seen every time I do that, whether it's specifically my story or not. Um, I feel like I, you know, every time I see that movie or, or read that play, it's like a, a cheer, a little part of me. And that's how I feel about that. Absolutely, you know, I, in a previous discussion panel here, I was a guest and I brought up um, the intersectionality of seeing yourself on, on stage or screen as Joyce. And to me, that was, you know, the 1997 Brandy Cinderella where it was the most diverse cast being nothing but so proud of who they were. And I think as we consume theater and as we create theater, we need those, we need those wins. We need, we need to feel good and joyous about who we are. All right, speaking of that, um, what is a positive experience you've had as a, as a person of the, in the LGBTQ plus community in theater? We, we talk so much about, you know, the negative and, and the sad, but what have, what have been your guys' wins? Can I just say, A, it felt great to be asked to be on this panel. That was lovely. Um, that felt like a win and um, the success of another theater company here has been a win. I mean, I sort of watched it from the time, you know, when Taylor and Casey were students and they're building this company. And the fact that it's doing so well to me is um, awesome, delightful, amazing, heartwarming and a huge win. Totally agree. Absolutely. <laughs> um, wh what was the question again? I'm sorry. Uh, no, no problem. What are, what are the positive experiences or the wins you've had as, as a queer artist in the community? You know, it's funny. Um, for me, I guess my standards are kind of low because I think just being trans and, and auditioning for things, I did not expect uh, anything, anything of it at all. And um, I guess when I did that show in 2008, when I did Forum, um, being cast as Gymnasia, it was like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, and it was the first show I did post-transition. I mean, I'd done tons before and Honestly, that was, that was a huge confidence boost because I thought, wow, I can actually do it, you know? And, 
And it, even though it was a weird situation, it still in, in more ways than one was a very positive. And then uh, auditioning for other shows in the last few years, I finally, I moved back to Utah two and a half years ago. I was in LA for a while and did other things, but um, I've been auditioning here all the time. Um, and honestly being like not being told you know no no we're not doing that no we don't know how to deal with we don't know what to do with you um it, you know oddly enough I, I i auditioned for hedwig in another show uh in another theater um not another theater i did audition for that show <laughs> but that's a different story but um uh i i auditioned at a theater in salt lake uh last year for Hedwig and the first thing she said the stage director said was oh we're we're not casting any women for Hedwig and I was kind of but you know to me I was like I was like oh well I'm trans and they were like oh okay <laughs> but at first and maybe it's a small victory but I was like oh, okay that's that's kind of cool that she just didn't read me immediately you know she didn't like clock clock is technically the word but Sorry, but um, yeah, it was just, for me, that was a victory. And I thought that was cool. It was a weird situation, but it was cool. For me, I guess, I guess my standards are low, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that definitely feels like a win and sounds like a win. For me, so, um, so I went to UVU for theater for like two or three years and then I transferred to the U for two or three years for art history and English for a minute for some reason. And I came back to UVU for theater again. Um, and for me, when I came back, it felt like a very different place than when I left. Um, and while there were still some old ideas hanging around, there was also just this like new welcoming creative feeling, um, which Lisa was a big part of that. Um, and it, I felt like I could make and explore and do the queer theater um, there. And I could just really go beyond just, yeah, and performing and like, hey, I want to actually examine these representations and and make them. Um, and I never really got any pushback from that. Um, I mean, like, other than that one conversation I mentioned in that directing class. Um, and so like to find, I, I was so used to, and the, kind of going further to like the founding of Anna the Theater Company. Um, I, I mean, I grew up in Linden, so I'm, I'm from, very near where I live now. Um, and I remember my high school, we would, the theater department would get like hate mail from the community for like things, doing things that were too risque, which it's, was, uh, it's the high school and we didn't do anything that most high schools do. So it was bizarre. And then you always hear about like Hale Orem getting similar letters about just ridiculous stuff. So I assumed that when we opened the theater, I was sure that like, if we didn't get stuff complaints directly, that like the mall would be getting complaints and like, we'd have to be like coordinating a lot of stuff. And we haven't gotten any of that. Um, and I think part of it is that we're very clear about what we are. And so we don't get a lot of like old conservative people that are like, oh, I just want to see a nice musical about whatever it is they want to see. Um, and so it just, it's been so wonderful to realize like, oh, like there is a community, like a community like that can exist here. It just wasn't in the places I've looked before. Um, so I think that's kind of been one of the most affirming things for me. Absolutely. And I know we're on a podcast that is, you know, sponsored by another theater company, but I just want to take a moment and officially say thank you for creating a space for diverse voices and new theater, because I know as a um, high schooler, you always saw the same 
seven shows over and over again. And even into college, you, you would, I, start, I started to see more work, but it wasn't until another theater company where it, I went, wow, there is, there is a place for this. And there's an audience for that, which I think for me at the time was very surprising, but now it, you know, it just makes sense. I 100% agree with that. <laughs> I, I'm 100% attracted to another theater because not to not to do a little round table here, but uh, another theater because they are doing stuff that I've never even heard of. And I think that's really cool. Like Mr. Burns, I've never heard of that. And I thought it was great. You know what I mean? It's stuff like that. And yeah, I'm tired of Forever Plaid in Oklahoma and, and, and all of that stuff. I'm just 100% sick of it. And boy, I'm seeing 100% a lot. <laughs> I'm 100% serious on this. <laughs> but I think, I think they're great. And um, I just, you guys are gonna succeed so well. Like, I, I feel like um, when you take a dare and when you dare, not take a dare, but when you dare to do something in, in an area where people pretend that, that's, that there's this preset audience and you, you create something that's for the other people um, in that city. I think it's just brilliant. And I think Rent did that really well. When Rent came through, people back in the 90s, people were like, oh, Rent will never play in Utah. It's just too horrible and stuff. And I went to one of the first showings in Rent in Salt Lake. This is like 98. And it was packed. It was sold out. And it's like, I knew it would be because there's not just this old fuddy-duddy Gonna, gonna write a complaint. I mean, we got complaints on guys and dolls. You know what I mean? And that's like not a weird show. <laughs> like that's not controversial. <laughs> but anyway, just, just to say, just to, re, just to agree with, with Alec. Um, yeah, you guys are doing awesome. I, just, I think it's great. I'm 100% for you. Um, so, sorry, uh, the question, what was the question again, sorry? <laughs> Uh, no problem. What are what, what's a positive experience or a win you've had in theater as a queer artist? Oh, okay, great. Um, if I may, my, my laptop died, so I don't know who's answered this question who hasn't. So um, I'm just going to jump in. Uh, I think the most rewarding experience I've had so far um, was when another um, put up my play safe. Um, like I mentioned before, it's a love story about two women within a particular faith system and how they work through that uh, together and the ups and downs and um, what their love story is. And um, it was just a really personal story that like came from a personal place that took me four years to finally like get to a place where I could say, Taylor, Casey, read this, please. And let's see what happens. And um, I was pretty terrified of what the response would be, especially um, with a theater that lives in Provo, um, what would be the reception to um, actually seeing uh, a lesbian believing LDS woman and a bisexual questioning LDS woman. What would happen? Um, would there be a considerable amount of backlash? And instead what I found, um, I'm gonna share a really personal experience. So my, um, my father-in-law is one of the most conservative, amazing men that I've met in my life. Um, and I was very nervous to have him come see the show. And uh, we all went on opening night. And um, it turns out that he didn't know what the show was about until he got there. <laughs> so, he, so he went in with like a completely blank slate. And we, uh, and I keep glancing at him to see how he's handling everything. Um, and at the very end of the first scene, um, Aubrey and Sam are my other two characters and they meet at BYU. And that's the first scene of the play. And um, at the very end of that scene, um, my father-in-law just looked over at me, sorry, with tears in his eyes. And he said, oh, I know what this is. And um, when we finished the show, he came up to me and, uh, he, he said, I, I was rooting for them and I didn't think that that would happen. And it's because their love is so pure and, um, and you just believe it and you feel it regardless of whether or not um, you believe a certain thing. And yeah, I think that's been the most 
positive and rewarding experience that I've had as an LGBTQ plus um, playwright within theater is actually having an effect on someone that you didn't think you would. So. Thank you so much for sharing that. That is beautiful, beautiful. I, all of these conversations lead to the, you know, the age old uh, saying, if you build it, they will come. People want these stories and I think so so often we get to the this mindset that no this is this is a story that's meant for this small group but in fact a lot of the the queer stories and the lgbtq plus stories in theater would would do so beautifully to a larger wider audience um we've got just a few uh moments more so i've got two more questions for us the first is with microaggressions being more on the forefront of people's mindsets, what are some microaggressions that you've witnessed or experienced in theater? Now, for those at home, microaggressions often come across as very casual or something that you would, it would be a non sequitur normally. And as someone who experiences them, they can be potentially catastrophic. So I would just like to hear from you guys uh, what those have been like. Um, I, you know, honestly, I don't, I don't know if I have any specific examples. Um, I think that just mentioning dressing rooms in a questionable way is, uh, you know, even the last show I did, there was a guy who did that, but um, I didn't really care what his opinion was. You know, I was just like, I don't, I don't care. And I asked the I asked the other ladies in the show, I said, do you guys have an issue with this? And they, uh, they were like, no, not at all. And so it was kind of like that, but he would, he would hint at it sometimes. And that was very micro. Um, but other than that, you know, I don't know if I really have anything that I would consider in, in that aspect, microaggression. Um, it's just, it's getting so much better. I mean, it's just such a different world. I can't, uh, emphasize that enough it's just a hundred percent different world even 10 years ago mm. and i think the some of these things that are coming into light uh help uh, so much it's amazing absolutely thank you yeah um i completely agree that we are in a much better spot and we still have a lot of room to grow when it comes to microaggressions and all that. Um, I think I think the most where I've experienced it was in grad school with older male writers, because um, our our program had lots of different ages, lots of different kinds of people. Like we're all we're from all over the place in one room reading plays <laughs> and workshopping. Um, so often I like working on safe other um, other LGBTQ stories from a woman's perspective, that frame of mind. Um, often my critiques that would be given um, were more so about the content of the play and the and judging of the characters' relationships and the um, once again the validity of it and the legitimacy of these relationships between women. Um, so questioning that rather than uh, you know workshopping a play. <laughs> and so often um, my. Uh, when, when I would bring pages in to be worked, um, rather than, hey, uh, this dialogue isn't quite working. Where are you wanting beats to land and stuff like that? It instead turned into a complete judgment of the characters and also men talking over me <laughs> in those conversations. So um, so yeah, I, I think that's really the last time that I've experienced a microaggression. Um, and yeah, we're getting better, right? We're getting better. Oh, absolutely. What what would you say in, in that situation of A, not only being spoken over, which is so inappropriate, but taking your work and not judging it based on its merit, but as opposed to conventional thinking? Yeah. Um I, so how I decided to handle that was when I would be giving feedback to other people, I was as constructive and succinct as possible, and I never made judgments on their characters. And I think that they saw from, I guess, how I decided to handle their work, they then realized, oh, 
I need to change my way of thinking and how I give feedback. And um, it like also instructors being great, stepping in when they need to um, and handling the situation rather than putting it on a fellow student to do that. So um, yeah, so I think, I think that's how it was handled, so yeah. Awesome. Thank you. It's, it's hard to put in the work when you are, when you are the person having to do the education, the educating, but thank you. I, I completely agree with you, Chelsea. I was the only woman in my master's playwriting cohort um, and the youngest. So I experienced a lot of that. And I would say the microaggressions I experienced usually have to co come from much more being a woman than um, anything else, although I do think that, um, and I think that's mostly because people who don't know me probably wouldn't guess that I'm married to a woman. Um, so uh, yeah, just a lot of like little little digs and, and, um, and questioning whether I really knew what I wanted or knew what I was doing. And as a writer, lots of talking over um, that still happens to me in a creative room. Um, I usually just try and say, I wasn't, I wasn't quite finished and then just keep going. And usually people are okay with that. Um, but yeah, a lot of like making comments that have to do with whether you should be there in the room in the first place, rather than the merit of your work. And I think that, that you know, you, you feel that you have to work harder to prove you should be there where other people seem to bring in crap and they're like, yeah, okay, let's work on this. <laughs> and you have to be 10 steps ahead. And I feel like that sometimes as a female director too, that I have to be better. I have to work harder. I have to be nicer in order to get there. That's something I have, so, oh, sorry, can I? Oh, go, no, go ahead, please. Jump in real please. quick. Um, that's something I've noticed um, being on kind of the producing end of theater is that I found women and just generally queer people tend to, um, Sure, like if they want an opportunity, tend to one work for it more, but also be like, here's here's all the reasons I'm qualified. Whereas straight white men tend to tell what they want, what opportunity they want to be given. Um, just like, a, oh, hey, you guys should do this show and let me direct. And like, okay, there's a process. Um, tell me why you're qualified for that. Like you might be, but I don't know that. Um, and it's, it's so interesting to me to see how our society has kind of been structured in a way where straight white cisgender men can just like, yeah, I'm just gonna succeed because I'm awesome. Um, and how much it kind of just devalues everyone else's experience. Um, and it's stupid um, because I think in part, not as a result of that, but I mean, kind of, because I think that in actuality, like that mentality actually fosters mediocrity in those people that get opportunities. So like really, if you look at the work that women or queer people are making, it's usually so much more interesting. Um, so it's baffling to me. Like when you said that there was, you, that you were the only, at least said that you were the only woman in your master's cohort, that's so, like that feels wrong to me. Like I don't think it, like a university shouldn't be allowed to do that. Um, and it's- There were also- no, no people of color. That's, that's mm. so strange. Um, just because I think that everyone suffers as a result of that. And well, and isn't it funny, Taylor, when I presented a show to you for the season that died with COVID, 
I was like, look, I'm coming in with a full budget, a fully realized pitch deck and like the full thing. It's exactly what you're saying, feeling that you need to like earn your keep. I went well, like that, that show. It, it's funny because usually when people say, hey, have you guys thought about, I have a show that you guys should do. Usually it's very like, oh, cool, tell me about it. I'll, I'll look into it. And then like, maybe I'll pitch it at our meeting. Um, your like pitch for that is like one of the only ones that's ever just been like, yeah, it's it's pitched at our meeting because you did the work. Um, and it's, yeah, anyway, stupid COVID for making things not over. <laughs> it, it sounds like, you know, the, the experiences of being someone in the LGBTQ plus community affects how we are in a, a theater space, a theatrical space, which is interesting because theater like is the forefront of civilization as it were. We, we see more diversity and inclusivity there than we do typically, but still we've got some of the age old problems just going around and around and around. Um, before we end, I, I want to finish up with this last question. When I was asked to moderate this panel, I was given a list of previously asked questions and the final one typically being, who are people you look up to? And I saw that and I liked the question, but I want to tilt that on its head. As queer artists um, performing and honing your craft and being at the top of your skill set, what do you say to people who look up to you, who might know you or might not know you. I work in the school setting. And so I see lots and lots of uh, growing uh, uh, students who may or may not be part of the LGBTQ plus community. And so often I wish there was so much I could say. And so this is your chance to speak directly to them or your younger self as it were. Well, I heavily doubt anybody looks up to me, but not if they did, <laughs> Well, if they did, I would definitely say, um, don't be afraid to, if you're trans, if you're even just, you know, even just, it, it, you don't have to be trans, you can be anything. Um, if you're doing a show, don't be afraid to do, uh, don't be afraid to do the character the way that it's supposed to, or, or supposed to, but written or, or directed, but also don't, don't be afraid to do your own weird twist or take something from another from another show and 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 add that to the character um you know it's up to the director but in all reality uh, it, it's just it's so much more rewarding and um i think like another thing i i i would love for i told this to a girl um just in the last show i did that uh, cause she said, um, or I, I was doing the, sh <clears throat> excuse me, I was doing the show, straight female, all that. And, um, after the show closed, we do like a karaoke night and I did, I did, um, sweet transvestite. And, uh, she was like, how is it that you can go from female to like sexy, raunchy transvestite man, like so quickly. And, uh, I was just like, well, because I grew up that way, you know, <laughs> I grew up. I've grown up twice in many ways, and it's just another channel. And I think you shouldn't be afraid to think, oh, well, I'm trans, I need to be as girly as possible and stuff, because it's really weird if you do that. But then again, if you're like um, thinking, and I, I fall into this trap all the time, um, oh, well, I'm trans, so I can only, I can only audition for uh, you know, those roles, which are very rare, but they do exist. Um, Hedwig, I will give the exception to, <laughs> but it's like, you don't have to be like, I'm not going to go audition for Audrey and then be as girly as humanly possible because it's like, they're, they're not, it's hard to explain, but I just don't think it's authentic. Mm -hmm. That's just, that's what I think. Thank you so much. I guess I'll jump in. Um, if there are people who look up to me, I would say that you can talk and dream and think all you want, but I want you 
to do, to do, to act imperfectly and over and over, and that your voice comes to bear upon that work without mitigation, without um, transformation, and that it is intriguing just as it is, just exactly as it is, but you have to do like to write that play that maybe your first play is crappy. Great, write it and then write another one and, and maybe do that show or maybe make that comment or um, write that essay or apply to that school, whatever it is that you don't, you know, you need to change nothing to make yourself interesting. And I'm gonna go ahead and answer who do I look up to just because, um, I look up to my children because they are unmitigated. They are themselves and I love that. And I look up to my students because um, they are, they're interesting, intelligent, fascinating um, people who are doing stuff all the time and they make me wanna do the same thing and keep up. And um, I feel really honored to work with my students in class and in shows and with actors in the community and creative people in the community. I feel super honored to get to be in the room. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, think, I think just talking to maybe a younger Chelsea who really wanted to do theater, but also was super confused on the feelings and the hormones that were going on. Um, in high school. <laughs> um, I would just say uh, that, um, that that you're going to be okay um, and that the art that you create um, is, is going to be really hard to create, um, but you're strong enough to do it. And what's, what's even better than that is that um, you can be a strength to other people. Um, and so, yeah, it's kind of weird to think about if anyone looks up to me, I don't, well, I don't know. <laughs> um, but uh, um, yeah, I, I think that's just what advice I guess I would give is just that uh, your voice matters. And if it doesn't feel strong yet, um, you're, you are able to do um, theater and create your voice and um, speak up for yourself because you're really cool and you're really special. And, um, and the more weird and special and awesome you know, why wouldn't we want that in theater? So anyway, just my two cents. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> um, I, when, when I saw that question, I was kind of taken aback because it was like, oh, there are there people that look, huh, okay, <laughs> people might, okay. All right, I'll, I'll think about what I would say. Um, I, my biggest, I guess thing of just general advice that there's a line in the Laramie project um, where they're interviewing people from Laramie, Wyoming. And there's some per one person who um, I think it's someone who grew up in Laramie and lives there again. And it's a gay man. I'm trying to remember who it is. Um, but he said sometimes he runs into people in like Denver at like a gay bar and he, when they find out he's from Laramie, they say like, oh, I, I, I grew up in Laramie. I, I miss it. I wish that I could live there. And that for me is very much kind of my experience with Utah County, um, that like most of the LGBT people I know that grew up here tend to move to Salt Lake or out of state because it's like, well, there's not a place for me here in Provo. Um, and I think that just do what you wanna do. Um, there's a, this person, Connor Habib, he's a academic slash former gay porn star, um, but he is a just wonderful person with a really great mind and he, said this thing once that's, um, if you don't like the world you're in, um, do, he, he says, do what Bugs Bunny would do. Um, and it's draw a door. Um, so if you don't like the world that you're in, make a new one, draw a door and go through it, find something else. 
Um, and like, it's kind of that whole idea of like, be, be the change you want to see in the world. So just do the thing you want to do where you want to do it. And if that community doesn't seem like it has a space for you, then make a new one, um, which is always easier said than done. And it's not always the most realistic thing to do for everyone, but there is a realistic version of it for everyone. Not everyone may have all of the options that they want, but I think most people have more options than they realize. Um, I guess that's all. Just, just do what you wanna do. Make the theater you wanna make and do it because you enjoy it. Don't worry about money. I mean, I guess worry about money because that's important, but like make art because you want to make that art and don't forget that. Beautiful. Thank you all so much. I want to say in the past, you know, hour and 10 or so minutes, um, I look up to you all now. Uh, thank you so much for being so vulnerable and so open and so willing to share. Uh, well, once again, my name is Alec Powell and on behalf of another theater company, I would like to thank you all for listening to our platform series on LGBTQ plus issues. Thank you.